Okay, cool. Uh, up next, we have Chris Robeson from Horde talking about baking utility into NFTs. So I'm sure many of you have heard about non-fungible tokens, otherwise known as NFTs or ERC721 tokens by now. Super hot topic, lots of really exciting projects happening in the space. So let's hear about it from Chris. Sweet. Okay. Thank you guys for sticking around and for, uh, I don't know, being here, listening to the presentations. I think I saw MP just a little bit earlier. Thank you for organizing the event and for all the volunteers. So, jumping into it, the title of this presentation is Baking Utility into NFTs, How to Create Value with Non-Fungible Tokens Beyond Simple Scarcity. So the purpose of this talk is to explore different crypto economic models that might work for NFTs beyond just there being a limited number of tokens, or in other words, going with the collectibles model. So my name is Chris Robison, and I'm with Horde, where we are designing true ownership within video games. The premise of this talk is that video games are the original virtual economies, and so by looking at them, there's a lot that we can learn from them. So the agenda for today is to start with an introduction to NFTs, just to catch everyone up to speed. I think probably most of you guys are familiar with them, um, but as I understand it, this is the only talk on non-fungible tokens, so we're just gonna begin there. Then we're gonna talk about scarcity, which has been the pervasive model thus far. We're gonna talk about sort of the economics about uh, why that might not be the most viable business strategy moving forward if it's your only strategy. And then we're gonna look at three other strategies um, for designing utility with NFTs, and those are using the NFT to be productive, um, using them to design over gaps in ecosystems, and to uh, bind people together who have different specializations towards a common goal. So, introduction is, what is an NFT anyway? So, NFT stands for non-fungible token, and that is a single token that cannot be replaced by an identical digital asset or utility. So, what does that mean in practical terms? Here are three examples. We can look at a house token, one token that might represent a physical house in the real world. We could also look at a debt asset, like a virtual loan. Um, and we can also look at something like video game armor. Each one of these could be unique. Each one has its own history. And each one is non-fungible, meaning that if you have one house token and you exchange it for another house token, uh, that's not exactly an equal trade. You're actually getting two completely different houses. They have different neighborhoods, different neighbors, different views, different layouts, it's entirely unique. Whereas with Ether, if you trade two Ether for each other, no one Ether is more valuable than another Ether, so you're getting an equal value. So the problem that we're looking to solve here is we're trying to figure out where do we biddle NFTs to create value. So a few things to acknowledge when looking at this problem is that NFTs are just one tool, and there are many other tools out there in the ecosystem. And this vast landscape of combinations is constantly changing. Therefore, a lot of the use cases for NFTs haven't been created yet. So you can see over here on the side, there is a picture of a CryptoKitty, which was the first NFT to be designed and launched and deployed on mainnet. Um, and it's laid over a game board, uh, Weichi, just ex exemplifying that it was the first one uh, that was sort of laid in the ecosystem. And everyone's sort of trying to figure out where to make plays after this. So if we're looking to decide where to create value with NFTs, then it's important to understand what value drivers are. So we can break it down into three rough categories. Um, the first one is basic utility. So this means that the NFT would be useful, profitable, or beneficial in some way. And it's important to understand that this would be an objective attribute, meaning that profitability, that usefulness would be the same for anybody if they were in a similar situation. Then we could look at something like entertainment, which is obviously very popular in video games. But I'm going to separate this out just a little bit because uh, entertainment is a very subjective topic, meaning what I find entertaining and what you find entertaining could be completely different. And what we're willing to pay to be entertained for a certain amount of time is also very different. The third value driver is speculation. And this is where you are purchasing something with the hopes that you're going to return a profit, but you also recognize that there's a potential downside. This is also not, this is different than the other two categories in that it's completely separated from your own personal experience, meaning no utility has been being generated for yourself or those around you. You're not personally being entertained. In fact, the work that's being done to create the value is done entirely by somebody else. 
So with that understanding, we can jump into what the first topic or the first strategy has been for NFTs thus far, and that is designing scarcity or collectibles. We're gonna look at why this is a monopolistic strategy and why it by itself doesn't really work moving forward. So what is a monopolistic strategy? When a monopolist enters a market and they're profit seeking, they will always produce a smaller quantity of goods, meaning artificial scarcity, at a higher price than a perfectly competitive market would. So taking a look at this in practical terms, we can examine and compare a competitive market versus a monopoly. And we can see in a competitive market, the quantity of goods and the price end up hitting an equilibrium with the market. In a monopoly, we can see that a lower quantity of goods is produced at that higher price, like we saw in that quote, but we should ask ourselves, why is that? The gray boxes here represent the revenue generated in each one of these types of markets. And as you can see, the competitive market actually generates more revenue than the monopoly. So if monopoly has complete control over the ecosystem, why would they not just produce what would generate the most revenue? And that's because this is oversimplified, but there's costs involved. And this is true even with NFTs. You have design costs, you have developmental costs, you even have just standard maintenance costs with keeping your website uh, up and running. And so in this case, we can see that uh, a monopolistic strategy would generate more profit. So obviously that is more desirable for any sort of NFT project in the pursuit of creating something like a collectible. So at this point, it's important to take a look at a timeline of when NFTs began, and that was at F Waterloo when CryptoKitties launched. They did in fact create a limited quantity, which was probably less than the total market demand for collectibles in general. And so that's probably why the price hit such a high point. That's why it jammed up the Ethereum blockchain. It was entering a freshly new market, which meant it had a monopoly over the collectibles market. Nowadays, there are a lot of other collectible projects that are trying to go after a similar, similar model. They're trying to be the next big collectible and hopefully capture all of the excitement um, like CryptoKitties did. However, it's important to note here that each one of these projects is not operating in its own independent silo. In fact, at this point, you could say that they're all now competing in a similar market for scarcity. So if one collectible becomes too scarce, uh, if you're looking to just make money, you can now simply move on to another collectible. TechCrunch just two weeks ago published an article titled Why the Next Crypto Kitties Won't Be About Collectibles. I think this kind of illustrates the point from an economics perspective, so I do agree with their thesis there. So the first opportunity that we have with NFTs is to use them to become productive. So where we can calculate sort of a cash flow, maybe revenue, and also calculate risk that's involved with holding an NFT. So in the video games uh, world, we can measure the productivity of items, and this is pretty common. So in this scenario, we have two different swords. We have a single sword and we have a double sword. The single sword can be purchased for 100 loot, um, and it has the utility of being able to generate about 200 loot over the course of 10 hours on average for the average game player. Okay, so the double sword, coincidentally, costs then 200 loot. So uh, it would be valuable for a player to collect this because over the same average 10 hours of gameplay, they'd be able to collect 500 loot. So it's two and a half times more productive. What a gameplay scenario might look like is a player begins a game and they're instantly given 100 loot to begin that game. They go to a marketplace and they purchase the single sword and then they go to battle, say, a dragon. So over the course of one hour of gameplay, they would earn 20 loot. At this point, they have a decision to make. They can decide, is this fun? And if it is, then they'll keep playing. They'll do this again for 10 more hours until they earn that 200 loot. And then they go to a market where they can buy their double sword. If, on the other hand, they look at the situation, I think like, eh, it's just okay, and they wanna augment their experience in some way, then they can go ahead and speed up that process, just go to the market, buy that double sword for 200, or for 0.1 ETH, and then they get their double sword. Uh, looking at both of these scenarios, it's important to look at what the costs are in either decision. And that would be either spending 10 hours of time earning the sword or paying 0.1 ETH to just buy the sword. And so we can see based on that, there is a time cost. The player who goes out and just purchases their, purchases their double sword would value their time, we expect, at least, at at least 0.01 ETH per hour. And they would do that 
in the hopes of then returning an increase of 30 loot per hour to their production. So comparing that to the crypto space, we can look at a project like Dharma, uh, where an investor has the ability to go out to a marketplace and they can pick up some debt asset. And similarly, they, they have a similar uh, decision model to follow, where they can choose to earn income over the course of, say, six months, or they can buy a debt asset for 10 ETH. And there's an opportunity cost of, say, 10 ETH over the course of six months amortized. And uh, the return to their production that they're hoping to make, the return on their investment, could be something like 15% per year on their money. So you can see the upside to both of these kinds of systems are very similar. They're both hoping to return some increase to their productivity. But there is one big difference, is that in video games, it's designed into the ecosystem. And so when you have that asset, it's guaranteed that you're always going to earn that extra 30 loot with that double sword. And that's not always the case with a project, say, uh, like Dharma, um, where that 15% doesn't just come out of a designed ecosystem, right? It's actually coming from a potential downside, and that is the probability that there's going to be a default on that loan. That's not to say that there aren't downsides to video games, because in fact there are. If you go ahead and you spend a lot of money or time in a video game, it could become dramatically less popular over time and you've just spent or wasted a lot of time and money in that ecosystem. So moving on to the next opportunity is using NFTs to design over gaps in existing ecosystems. Um, this is a way to create subversive institutions. So a design gap is a failed or forgotten institution. In the case of video games, it might be just a glitch in the game. So design gaps typically prevent players from achieving certain objectives, or it can enable them to do unexpected things in video games. And these are typically solved for by leveraging or utilizing in-game items. So an example of a game exploit might be like this one in Halo. Oops. where a player has figured out a way to lodge themselves inside of this wall where no other player can reach them, and so they're able to have an advantage where they can snipe other players without the other players being able to reach them. So how did they achieve this? They figured out that there is a way to drive a vehicle up into a particular spot, and once they get that vehicle in the spot, then they use the vehicle's exit vehicle command to lodge themselves into that wall. So they're using an item in a way that it wasn't supposed to be used due to an exploit in the game. Other game exploits are slightly more economic in nature, so let's touch, a ba touch base on one of those. This is Ultima Online. It's a massive multiplayer online game. In it, there was a bug found in the code base that allowed the supply of gold to be accessible to anyone, so you could just basically print off your own supply of money, making the in-game economy sort of worthless and broken at that point. The way that players figured out uh, how to maintain their in-game economy was they discovered that the game designers happened to, for fun, put a bunch of horse dung throughout the video game. So they ended up picking that up, and then they traded that as their in-game currency. When I was looking for examples of subversive design, basically finding existing ecosystems where you could inject NFTs into them, I wasn't able to find any. However, there is a project recently that launched called Marble that I think kind of does something like this. Um, but when I did this presentation, that wasn't out there, it wasn't on my radar, so my brother and I produced one with a developer who's hacking here this week uh, named Jasper, and it's called NF Tweets. So the idea is you can create a non-fungible token in the Twitter universe by logging into this portal, and in this portal you can go ahead, type in your tweet as you would normally. You go ahead and you sign a transaction, when you sign that transaction and it confirms, your tweet is then published to your Twitter handle. NF Tweets goes ahead and retweets that for you, so it provides you with a bit of visibility. And then you can go back to your wallet, where you'll be able to see that you now own that tweet. So that string is now unique, and that is what is the identifier for that non-fungible token. Uh, what does this mean exactly? Not totally sure. This is sort of experimental, and that's kind of the point of like these hackathons, right? So this is meant to inspire you guys to try and think about where there are gaps in current systems, um, as far as where this could fit in for the Twitter universe. Maybe NF tweets becomes the horse dung of Twitter. Okay. So moving on to specialization, using NFTs to 
find different individuals who have specializations and bringing them together to achieve some common goal or purpose. So specialization is when players leverage different skills to work together towards a common goal. Uh, and these typically emerge around a particular item. So here's an example of Mario Party where Wario is the coin collector and Yoshi is the boat driver and they're using the boat as the item to attempt to win the race. So we could look at this diagrammed as such. If we go back to the Dharma example from earlier, um, and as uh, was talked about earlier today as well, um, there's four different individuals that come together to make the Dharma system work and make it valuable around that unique debt asset. And that's the debtor, creditor, underwriter, and relayer. So, so the diagram looks like this, and you, just, you can see there are parallels involved in both of these. Another project doing something similar where multiple people with specializations come together towards a common goal is a project called Trust Token where you're tokenizing and creating security tokens, um, say for example for a house. So the homeowner owns the house, they give it to a trust which is run by a fiduciary who's legally responsible for uh, acting out the trust will and they can tokenize the house, give it to beneficiaries, you can then vote on say who to rent the house out to uh, in an Airbnb situation. And again, there are parallels here. So that's pretty much it with the exception of an extra life. Here are a few more ideas to take home with you, ideas from video games that you can take into the crypto economic system. So uh, there are keys in video games which in that allow players to access something. There are non-tradable items like badges and achievements. Um, the utility behind these is that it binds or bonds players to a particular ecosystem makes them loyal. Um, even in like World of Warcraft, there's such a thing as soul bonding for really valuable items. Uh, bundles are another great way to diversify the experience of an ecosystem, whereby one item is made up of many other items. Gifting is another great way to build utility if you create an ecosystem where gifting is a social norm. It, uh, the utility of the item being gifted doesn't have to be productive necessarily, it has to do with building relationships in that ecosystem. User-generated assets are also very valuable, whereby an ecosystem gives an individual a set of building blocks, they build the blocks together, and they create something unique as well. And finally, custom modifications such as skins or hats or whatever it might be, these are used to create some sort of unique or personal identity within an ecosystem. So. Thank you very much for listening. Follow us at Hort Exchange, and I am at C. Bob Robinson. Awesome, thank you.